on the gospel of life, Evangelium Vitae. Uh, Dr. Marco will be presenting on this topic. And uh, that document came out in 1995 uh, by Pope John Paul II, blessed Pope John Paul II. Um, a little bit before, he, when he came to uh, the United States in 93, I believe, for World Youth Day in Denver, he used that phrase, culture of death. And it became a little bit more popularized uh, in this document, uh, this encyclical that he wrote. Um, he really spells it out, the difference between a culture of life and a culture of death. Dr. Marco has been here at Aquinas since 1989? Yeah. 1989, 22 years. Uh, he is the chair of the theology department. Um, he teaches a lot of the intro to Catholicism courses here, the morality classes, the uh, social justice courses, and uh, you still doing Vatican II as well? Yeah. Vatican II as well. Um, to students and ex-students, he's known for his Marcoisms, uh, which there are many. I think there's a Facebook group devoted to it. Um, I think it still exists. Uh, but he is also known for bringing the church in the East uh, to attention, uh, expressing the true universality of the church, which has been a really great gift to students. If you're a student of his, pay attention. That's a thing you must learn. Um, and it's great as an ex-student to have been introduced to that as an undergraduate here that the church is bigger than the West. Uh, it, it is truly universal. Uh, he's also been doing some studies in Ukraine for the last several years, teaching and studying over there, which is great, kind of uh, helping his, his passion there with the East, been able to go over there, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, he's also been published uh, for many articles and book reviews in several scholarly journals. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Marco. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Does this work? So this works, right? Everyone hears me. Okay. I'm um, glad to be here. Um, Mark was one of my best students. I had him in several courses, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about the progress he's made in his own life. Um, I, first of all, I must make a confession, for I am a fallen away third degree knight. Uh, I am not a member now uh, of the Knights of Columbus, but had been in uh, my younger period for a year or so when I worked as a young volunteer in International Falls, Minnesota, and belonged to the chapter there. So I have not kept up my membership. <laughs> but nonetheless, I am incredibly grateful for all the work that the Knights of Columbus do and in support of life and other issues. I think you got a great deal on the... Uh, on the, the John Paul II Center in, in, in Washington, I was at a conference, actually, a, the Orientale Lumen conference in, in June there, when uh, it was mentioned by people there. We usually use that center for our conferences. It's a conference of Orthodox and, and Catholic theologians. Uh, but we were not this year because it was closed, uh, because it was being sold. And, and I remember people saying that they, you'll be very happy to hear who bought it. So I suspect that the loss for the Archdiocese of Detroit is your gain. Um, for those of us who've been engaged in this, in this movement for years, uh, and I have been, uh, I recall as an undergraduate, my, my professor of theology was Father Edward Bryce, who then went on to work in the Diocese of Pittsburgh in social justice questions. And then, and then later, uh, Father Bryce was the director of human life for the bishops. At that time in our history, those issues were very much connected together. I, I, I lament the fact, and maybe, I don't know if it's, the, if it's just Grand Rapids or our history, where those two issues have been split apart. Uh, I, I, I think that's been a, a tragedy. I suspect that a couple of you here would probably agree with me. But, uh, so I've been in this for a long time. Uh, and uh, I want to, uh, you know, I want you to think about your own involvement in this and how, the, how you came to this. But let me, let me comment on how, according to George Weigel, in one, his first biography of, of John Paul II, uh, describes how uh, Wojtyla came to this. It occurred at or about 7 a.m. or thereabouts on September 1st, 1939 while he was serving mass in Vavro Cathedral on that fateful day, Luftwaffe bombs began falling on Krakow. Several uh, weeks later, after a narrow escape from the, the, the pincers uh, created by the advance into Poland of the armies of the two world's greatest totalitarian 
powers. And remember, historically, it isn't just the, it isn't just the, uh, the Nazis who invaded Poland. It was the, it was the, the Soviets. Okay, this area of Poland, which is now present day Western Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Nazi Germany and, and Soviet Union. Many of Vatia's professors at the venerable Jagiellonian University were summarily shipped off to a concentration camp. With, well, dozens subsequently died. If you've seen the film at Katyn, the, the, the massacre of, by the Soviets of the Poles, which is in Polish, I think it's English subtitles. Has anyone seen that? The Katyn massacre, it's very good, I, I think, and it describes, if there's scenes in there in which this, this is occurring. You see them coming to the university. All right, this area fell under, under Nazi domination. But this is what one step in the Nazi strategy of decapitating Polish culture in order to reduce the Poles to a slave population that would eventually be starved and worked to death. As the Nazi governor of the rump of Poland, Hans Frank, put it, every vestige of Polish culture should be eliminated. They will work, they will eat little, and in the end, they will die out. There will never, ever be again a Poland. I think that's how John Paul II came to the great evil of, of according to Weigel anyway, of recognizing a culture of death that can come to any country. What I'd like to do uh, this afternoon, I guess, is, is divide this into three parts, like the Holy Trinity, and if any of you remember Gaul from your reading of, of Caesar. First, I'd like to give a short overview of the encyclical with some particular attention given to its methodology. I, I think probably uh, Professor Pastana addressed the methodology of natural law much better than I ever could. When Eric asked me about doing that topic, I said, I'm not the one to do it. I said, uh, Mark Pastana is certainly the one to do that. But I'm going to say a, thing, a few things about the methodology, particularly by the critics of, of, of this document. Secondly, I would like to trace, uh, trace with you certain selected passages with particular uh, attention given to the teaching authority of the document. I will claim, as, as many do, that this, this document in three places expresses the universal infallible magisterium of the church and therefore cannot be dissented from. Uh, I, certainly will, I will certainly do that. And I think there's people on all sides would agree with that. And thirdly, I would like to address the question of abortion and law in civil society. <clears throat> This is something that I addressed in a similar presentation at the 10th anniversary of the encyclical, and I, I see Pat Ryan here uh, uh, back at St. Isidore's, and I want to go back to some of that. <clears throat> but first, the overview. On the Solemnity of the Assumption, uh, March 25, 1995, Pope John Paul signed his long-awaited letter on the value and inviability of human life. It surely came as no surprise that in the letter that John Paul confirmed the church's traditional condemnation of all direct taking of innocent human life. However, what we will note, and we'll do this uh, later uh, for a special comment, is the formula that was used in specifically condemning murder, direct killing of the innocent, abortion, and euthanasia, as well as the grave violations of moral law. Moreover, it appears that on the issue of capital punishment, John Paul moved the church's tradition somewhat, noting that execution is only appropriate in cases of absolute necessity, in other words, when it would not be possible otherwise to defend society. Today, however, as a result of steady improvement in the organization of the penal system, such cases are very rare, if not practically non-existent. So it's kind of a on the practical level, he's, he's, he's against capital punishment. In the format of the letter, uh, he does, we have four specific chapters. First, there's an analysis of the present day threats to human life, with some very hard sayings about absolutizing individualistic freedom. I actually have a copy of the best summary I have ever come across of the letter. It's pink, but I'll give it to you later. I, I made about 100 copies, so take one. But it's, it's done by the Knights of Columbus. It was done by Russell Shaw way back in 2000 or so. But it's the best. Has anyone seen that on the? I don't think it's on the website anymore. I have an old copy of it. Is it on a website, do you know, Rick? But it's actually very, that's the best summary I've ever seen. I mean, the Vatican has a summary, you know, it's too wordy, you know. And then it's, uh, you know, you got other people giving a summary. You got the, uh, 
Peace and Justice Office from Minneapolis, St. Paul, doing it and trying to put in ordinary English for people because they assume you're all stupid. Uh, and, uh, and that's not great. But the best one I've ever seen is actually this one. And that's not a gratuitous comment. I think the, I think the Knights have done the best job in, or the, the writer they got in that area. And secondly, in the second chapter, he looks at the reflection upon the Judeo-Christian sense of life as a gift. One of the problems in the encyclical, according to its critics, is that it does life both as that as the, uh, the the material reality in which we exist now, as well as eternal life. So, and we'll talk about that. I think the critics have said that you know, well, you know, either or. Well, for John Paul, and I think for us, you can't separate those. Uh, uh, thirdly, an explanation of the commandment: "You shall not kill." And then, fourthly, uh, a call to create a new culture hospitable hospitable to life. I'm not going to address that at all. The Pope then closes with a with a uh, uh, um, a prayer to the Theotokos and and ask that ask Mary for her help. Actually, throughout the text, you'll notice he breaks into prayer and meditation. Unlike my approach in the past, I will say, uh, and I've done this a couple times in different contexts. I see Sister Colleen here. I did this. I tried to compare on campus Martin Luther King and John Paul II. All right, this is what you do in politically correct environments. All right, uh, but uh, uh, if you want anybody to show up, uh, in any event, I try to do something on that, which is an interesting mix. Um, but uh, I'm going to take something from that, something I did at St. Isidore's plus what I've done when Mark was a fine young undergraduate. But in the past, I, I have not addressed the, the question of, of content, of, of methodology, but more of content and context. I want to also suggest to you, unlike Professor Pastana, I come at this as a, as a theologian, not a philosopher. I recall one time a, a lunch conversation with Father David Burrell of Notre Dame, who, held, who holds two appointments, one in the Department of Theology and one in the Department of Philosophy. And Burrell, I, I, we were talking about the two disciplines and how they, they, they differ. He says, if you want clear thinking, go to philosophy, or maybe some philosophers. But if you want to deal with real life, engage in theology. So. Uh, uh, if you want clear thinking, ask Pastana. All right. Uh, but if you want real life, you know, talk to us. All right. One of the, one of the, the most interesting critiques was a symposium that Georgetown University had on, on the document. And, and not unsurprisingly, uh, uh, many of the uh, moral theologians were somewhat critical of it. And I'm going to use just one. James Keenan, who is now at Boston College, was at Weston School of Theology before it merged. Keenan, in an analyzing the moral argumentation of Evangelium Vitae, offers rather critical observations about three, four areas. Actually, the text presentation, his use of scripture, secondly, uh, third, um, search for dialogue, and fourthly, application. I have a much more benign and generous view of the encyclical because I'm not a big leaguer. I'm a small leaguer. I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan, possibly. But uh, my, my reading is much more positive. But I want to rely upon Keenan here because I think it's important to look at his arguments. And there is some truth to some of them. So, so first of all, I want to, we want to look at how this document has been criticized. First, in presentation. The language is clearly exclusive and not inclusive. And that's probably the nature of, of Roman documents given Latin, right? All right. Uh, for some people, this is a big issue. For others, not an issue at all. I think some of our younger students purposely use man instead of human person just to be smart, Alex. All right. But for some of my generation who are trained, we tend to be much more inclusive in language usage. All right. So for some, it's a very big issue. I was talking to a student uh, Friday who's taken a course at, uh, at, at BC in theology. And one of the courses he says that's going on there is if you do not put, if you do not put parenthetically W-O before you put man, you're in serious trouble. So that's one, one argument. Uh, the meditation style is confusing to Keenan. Uh, in that sense, I think it's more of an exhortation of, uh, and call to conversion and a respect for the culture of life than a kind of nuanced argument, a natural law argument. I think there are those arguments in it, but I think there's some truth to that also. It's kind of a clarion call to be concerned about life in a culture of death. Um, in, in a third way, it's all over the place. I, I agree there. I know if you, Mark, when you read this as an undergrad, did you find that? 
He repeats it here, and then it's, it's, it's worse than my classes, for God's sake. All right, okay, yeah, this and that and that other. But he's all over the place. I, I think if he would have been at first grade at, at St. Thomas when my, my son John was there and the first grade teacher put seven boys on Ritalin, young Carol with Tia would have been put on Ritalin. All right, uh, all right so it's all over the place. <clears throat> Uh, in another article, interesting enough, another person besides Mark Postma calls John Paul II the Great, and that's Richard John Newhouse, and he concurs with uh, Keenan's critique of, of, the methodol of the presentational style of the letter, and I think there's something to that, but be that as it may. Uh, I actually like the breaking into meditation and the exhortation to embrace a gospel of life. To me, uh, to be sure, the Pope was dealing with life both as an eternal reality, life in Christ, right, which we're all called to, and as a physical good. So he's dealing with all of these, and some people say what's well, confusing. Well, I think in his own understanding that these are all connected, I think it's, it's valuable. I had a chance this time before I came here to listen to it. There's a, there's a website, I think it is, is Totius Tuus. Is anyone familiar with that? It's very good because what it has on there, you can download to your MP3s, which you people know about. I'm just learning how to use one. All right, you can download the document. And it is a meditative, it's, it's in an audible form, and it's part of a nine day novena around the themes of, of the gospel of life. There's also every encyclical that John Paul II has written is on that, that website. So when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm cutting the lawn, I can listen to this. I also listen to Al Cresta's uh, Cresta in the Afternoon. But uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, that's how boring the, the, uh, the, the lawn cutting can become. But uh, yeah, as, you, as, you look, as you look at that, I mean, it's a, real, it's a real great tool because as I listen to it, I listen to it as a spiritual text, not as an academic text to be ripped apart. And I think there's a real difference in there. All right. Uh, let me let me tell you what I what kept I kept on hearing when I when I heard this. I kept on reflecting about on the exultat in the Western Church that we, we that the, you know the exultat that we do on Easter Vigil. And let me quote you one passage of it because I think it shows this this connection. And you remember the exultat, you know, rejoice. And you remember some of you probably sing it, and some of you may sing it professionally in your parishes. This is, what it's, this is the section I'm going to highlight. This is the night when Jesus Christ broke the chains of death and rose triumphant from the grave. What good would life have been to us had Christ not come as our Redeemer? Father, how wonderful your care for us, how boundless your merciful love. To ransom a slave, you gave away your son. In other words, as you can see from the text, uh, you know, poetically, that that life itself, physical, biological life, would 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 not have the value it has if it wasn't for eternal life. It was interesting on yesterday's crest in the afternoon. I don't know if this was something taped before. Al might want to address this. There is that uh, David. Is it David Goldman? Yeah, David Goldman was talking about about the, and I think maybe you said or others that in Islamic culture where you've where you, we've become more and more secularized, you don't have kids, right? And why have kids? You know, if if this is it, right? If this is it, why have kids? I mean, I think there's something to that. My Eastern Bend also that Mark notes also gives me a kind of of appreciation of this, both in its length because their liturgies are god awful long, and its reputation. It, uh, it's re repetition, rather. Reputation, too, probably. But it's repetition, because if you can say it once, you might as well say it 500 times. Uh, so I, I think there's something to, to well, I recognize the arguments I'm saying that are all accurate. Secondly, um, I'd like to look at the issue of scripture for Kenan. Scripture does function differently in exhortation and humbly than in moral argument. Uh, that's one of the reasons I oftentimes get to cringe when people use scriptural text because they take them out of context and they do proof texting. That is not the way you do it in morality. But like the early church fathers, there is a spiritual meaning to texts that transcend its literal meaning, as the catechism says, that we need to pay attention to the, to the spiritual sense. Third, he criticizes, Kena criticizes that it is not dialogical enough in its approach to our culture. In engaging the culture, we must be respectful of it. 
I've seen comments both in the Commonwealth Magazine commentary on it and Dr. Jean Porter of Notre Dame that would support what Keenan is arguing here. The question becomes, how does one engage a culture when it appears that evil is being foisted upon us? And I think that's the issue. Uh, two Sundays ago, I heard the rather general, generally temperate and even-tempered Francis Cardinal George deliver a homily at St. Nicholas uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Cathedral in Chicago. George rallied against the state of Illinois telling the church what a Catholic institution is or not. He was dealing with an issue that came up at Xavier University. Actually, you may be right about Xavier University. <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> I mean, the state may be right. It isn't Catholic. Uh, he, rightly, he rightly then praised the repressed and courageous underground Ukrainian Catholic Church in its stand against the Soviet state. It was interesting. In other words, he looked at a church that's repressed. And my own experience there, both as a Fulbright scholar and as going back to the last couple of years, is that this is a church that is courageous. This is a church that endures suffering. George noted then that when society is secular, which I believe ours is, then the state becomes sacral. What is sacred? The state. And fourthly, Keenan even acknowledges that the local reception of the letter was very positive in general, which I think he would, he suggests, indicates that there is something quite awry in our culture when even those in secular media would recognize that there's some problem here in our culture. Okay. All right, my reflections then will follow. Let me, let me try to put these in some sense of order. All right, uh, they'll follow, and I'll simply try to quote some passages, and you have the text here. Um, uh, but let me note a general overview a little bit about this. Let me note in the beginning that this document does reflect the spirit without ever using the phrase of Cardinal Joseph Bernadine's consistent of life ethic. I recognize that most people in this room bat to the right of the plate, but quite candidly, there is, uh, <laughs> Tormella, what do you think, huh? Oh my God, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I've never been in a place where I become a flaming liberal. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm usually that reactionary conservative Catholic. Uh, but in any event, uh, I realize that. But there is clearly within that document an appreciation of a consistent act of life. I go back to my, my point. And I, I realize that some in the justice movement have sold out the, the right to life. There's no question in my, my mind. I come as somebody who comes out of both of those traditions, but where they were connected, huh? not presently where we have this, this disconnect, which I think is insane, and maybe it's just in Western Michigan where you're all nuts. All right, okay, that is why it concentrates on threats to, to death and uh, to life in its earliest and final phases, and I, there's no question about that. You know, look at the issues. Abortion, euthanasia, the only two get. It also indicts war, slaughter, and genocide, the violence of life done to millions of human beings, especially children who are forced into poverty, malnutrition, and hunger, the scandalous arms trade, the reckless tampering with the world's ecological balance, and he's not in favor, of, he's not making a statement here about global warming, we didn't even know about it then, all right, et cetera. The criminal spread of drugs and the abuse of the body and sexuality. Later then, in my presentation, I will address the difficult and clearly divisive political issue that the text raises. On, on how we ought to be first Catholic Christian rather than political in the worst sense of the word. And this certainly is part of my plea. So if I have a hermeneutic or a bias, or if I'm getting preachy, that's my, my, my claim. In that context, I rely on the work of the late Cardinal Dulles, um, where the Pope takes up the relationship between moral, moral and juridical orders, and he insists that civil law should protect the right to life without a doubt, in other words, uh, and that laws that deny such pr protection, even when passed by majority votes, are invalid. They're part of the tyranny of the majority, right? Since it's always wrong to destroy innocent human life, persons, persons who are ordered to do so by the doctors or state officials have a duty to object in conscience and to refuse compliance. In ruling out formal cooperation with evil, now those terms, are you familiar with those terms, formal and material cooperation? You know, when you intend, right? When you intend, when you intend this evil, and placing limits on material cooperation. I mean, you'd all have to move. I don't know where you'd move in, in this country from this country to find where you don't cooperate somehow materially with evil. Anybody? Ireland's even gone bad, huh? 
Poland's going crazy too. Everybody's going crazy. All right, I don't know. We have to die first, I guess, to to not have any any material cooperation with evil. The Pope is following traditional Catholic moral distinctions. His teaching, however, raises problems for some Catholic politicians and judges, since their election or appointment might depend upon their willingness to support permissive practices, especially regarding abortion. But the Pope will not rightly allow them to do this separation of private conscience from that of public conduct. All right, his only concession is, as we all know, and it's very legitimate, is that we, if, if in an impossible situation, if you have a law that will limit some abortions, then you, fall, you compromise on a political uh, agenda to allow that to happen, right? So in other words, if you can't ban everything, do the best you can. Okay. Let me make some particular comments. How much time do we have? I, I started about, about halfway through. Third, okay, please call on me. Let me give you a couple thoughts, a couple paragraphs. Uh, I think I, I just highlighted about 10 or 15, I think, that are significant, and I'll make a comment about them, but I'd rather you hear the words of the Pope than I, than mine, than my words. You listen to the Pope than me. Uh, for, second, second paragraph, this is what he says. The gospel of God's love for humankind the gospel of the dignity of the person and the gospel of life are a single and indivisible gospel. Throughout the text, as I listen to this, I, I, you know, I mean that w he ties together our human life, as I suggested, the material life, the redemption takes place in Christ, and then finally the end to which we're called. We are here, as you know, the old Baltimore Catechism. Anybody remember that question number three, why did God make me, huh? That old Baltimore Catechism, you know, that idea, in other words, yeah, but, I mean, that hasn't changed. All right, okay, all right. So, in other words, that's all connected. Thomas is, you know, we come from God, we go to God, right? This is the interesting, okay. As I, I know this, one finds this even, this, this notion within the writings of the church fathers, who oftentimes even break into meditation, which they see as a strength and not a weakness. While maybe not everyone in this room has read Augustine's full confessions, even those that were assigned it, uh, uh, might recall some lines such as, late have I loved you, O beauty so ancient and so, so new. Late have I loved you. Augustine breaks into prayer. This is also a style of the church fathers. And this is not seen as in a certain sense as being negative, but it's seen as something could be very positive. So you're connecting, you're connecting life and liturgy and intellectual thought and whatever. We don't do this. I mean, you've got clear thinking philosophers who separate all this out for us, right? But I, I, I think there's something to that style that I think is appropriate. In paragraph three, he has that famous quotation from the document, God Him at Space, the Church in the Modern World, the Joy and Hope, et cetera, document, that says this, and I want to reiterate this. This is very early on in encyclical. Whatever is opposed to life itself, such as any type of murder, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, or willful self-destruction, whatever violates the integrity of the human person, such as mutilation, torments inflicted on body or mind, attempts to coerce the will itself, whatever insults human dignity, such as subhuman living conditions, arbitrary imprisonment, deportation, slavery, prostitution, the selling of women and children, as well as disgraceful working conditions, where people are treated as mere instruments of gain rather than as free and responsible persons. All these things and others like it are infamies indeed. They poison human society and they do more harm to those who practice them than to those who suffer from the injury. Moreover, they are a supreme dishonor to the creator. I don't know if any of you have ever read uh, the famous book, Kiri Tim Boom's Hiding Place. Anyone ever read that? It's a great, actually, it's a very good book. I, I really was moved by it. I mean, I thought it was one of these uh, spire publications, you know, hokey religion crap. But, you know, it's actually very good on Providence. Uh, there's, a great, there's a great scene in there in which, in which Corey's sister Betsy and Corey are walking down the street in, in the, I don't know, it was Amsterdam, whatever Dutch, Dutch city it was, and they see Nazis beating, beating these, these, these Jewish people that, where they're carrying them off. And Betsy says, says to Corey, my God, those poor people. Corey thought, of course, it's the Jews that are being carried off. No, it was the Nazis who were doing the beating. I think we know in our own lives and our best experiences that it's much worse when we ourselves inflict evil on others or hurt on others than any hurt that we receive. We reflect upon this. 
Okay, the purpose of the letter stated in five, and he, he, I won't, I'll, I'll skip that for the sake of time. He tells us what it's about, and you kind of get a sense of what it's about. Um, in in, in uh, paragraph seven, he talks about why, why God does not create death. He delights in the living, but it's through the devil's envy that death enters into the world. This is not what ought to be, right? And yet, interesting enough, in our theology, it is death itself, physical death, which will bring us to eternal life. So how God reverses it, huh? So, so in other words, which is an evil, uh, in, in the Western understanding anyway, uh, death follows sin, right? The evils are, are, are sin and death. In the East, because of, because of death, we sin. I think it's a very interesting theology, theological but not doctrinal difference, let me say. But what we have here is a recognition that finally, the final way of eternal life is through, is through death. So how, the, how God reverses the whole thing. And, and, and uh, in paragraph 9, he uses the story of Cain and Abel, a great story. I'm not going to repeat it for you. Uh, even the critics of it said this was a good use of the biblical text. It's like his, his um, very taught a splendor document where he begins with the story of the rich young man. So in this sense, even those who are tend to critical about how John Paul II uses biblical text say this is a good way to use it. So you begin with the story, we enter into the story, and the story has something to say. In paragraph 10, he again argues for a consistent ethic of life. I'm not going to repeat it, but he does the same thing and says some of the things that we couldn't imagine. In paragraph 15, he thoughts about threats to life. He mentions the fact that in order to, to in our culture, we think that we eliminate suffering by eliminating the one who suffers. If you recall that in the beginning of the Holocaust in Germany, the first group that was targeted by, by the Nazis were those who were mentally and physically uh, deficient, right? Interesting enough, there was so much outrage by the, the, the Catholic and Protestants in that country at that time, clerics, that Hitler had to stop that program. Interesting. It would have been interesting if we, there would have been a more of a greater outcry, and I don't want to go back and look at history. I'm not a Monday morning quarterback. But I think there's something to the fact that that was that, the outrage of euthanasia, the eliminating of lives not worthy of life. You think about the German uh, t term that was used, lives not worthy of life. So he does I mention this because this is part of us. Um, in paragraph 22, he talks about the loss of God and how that contributes to this. I think he's absolutely right, huh? If I lose the sense of human beings as being made in the image and likeness of God, I am in serious trouble. Huh? Once God is out of the picture, and I, I oftentimes, and I, I appreciate very much the kindness of some, of some of my liberal colleagues who really seem to have a real love of humankind, but when push comes to shove, if I deny that the human person is made in the image of God, and I find that person despicable, and with good reason, of course, but if I find that person despicable, it it's becomes an issue. Huh? So it's easy to love. I was talking to a colleague about, about something. Is all oh, this person supposed to be so loving, so loving? So, and he says it's selective loving, though, right? You know, I mean, this is not selective loving we're called to, right? Once I lose the sense of every human being is made in the image of God, I am in, I'm in deep, I'm in deep uh, trouble. Chapter 2 deals with man's, the human person's life comes from God, the image of God, etc., etc. Uh, in paragraph 47, he mentions the fact, and I'll, I'll read this because it's significant, and you know this already. Certainly the life of a body in its earthly state is not an absolute good for the believer, especially as he or she may be asked to give up their life for a greater good. As Jesus says, whoever would save his life would lose, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. So we, are not, we do not take a vitalist position here. Human life is not the only end. I was at uh, St. Anne's home last night. I have a colleague who's, um, whose mother is dying. You know, and you know, one, one can let go, and we'll see this later. As you know, you know all this stuff. You know the ordinary, extraordinary, and everything else, passive, active euthanasia stories. But I think it's interesting. So here's the, the, the person is dying. And, you know, you don't have to hold on with everything. You don't have to use every kind of means to maintain. You'll probably be gone within a week. But, but, but physical, biological life is not an absolute value. Some of the critics seem to suggest that John Paul II is suggesting this. I don't think he is, as they read the documents. 
Chapter 3 ad uh, uh, addresses self-defense, which you're aware of. Did you talk about that at all, Mark? I was teaching this morning, so I don't know. Did you talk about self-defense and natural law? No, I can't. But you know the story there. You can do this. Uh, in lap light, he talks about the death penalty in paragraph 47. And let me read that for you. I think this is an important paragraph because it's the third issue dealt with. All right. All right. It is clear that for these purposes to be achieved, which is, which is defense, the nature and extent of the punishment of those who rob someone of life, I'm adding that parenthetically, must be carefully uh, evaluated and decided upon and not no, go, go to the extreme of executing the offender except in cases of absolute necessity. And then he goes through and says, in other words, only in situations where it would not be otherwise possible to defend society. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, today, such a result is um, such a result given our penal system is practically non-existent. And then he quotes the Catechism. Yeah, I find it very interesting. He appeals to the Catechism and the text in the Catechism, which supports his argument here. The change in the Catechism from the original French edition to the official Latin edition came about because of his teaching in places like St. Louis. Right? So in other words, I think it's clever that we can do it. In other words, he appeals, he appeals to the tradition that he already shaped. And that's a clever thing to do. I think it's great. I mean, in other words, in other words I hear what the tradition says. Well, he doesn't say it, but I gave you this tradition, or I'm, I'm involving this tradition. Now, to be sure, there are arguments uh, that, that would go contrary. I mean, uh, uh, in a, an article in First Things I read several years ago, uh, Antonio and Scalia took off, took issue with the Pope's teaching on this, right? And said maybe in some cases, you know, maybe he's moving the tradition too far. So you got somebody from the right criticizing them. You got people on both sides criticizing them. You know, got the left and then the right. All right. In any event, I want to take three paragraphs together in a couple couple minutes, and that is paragraphs 57, 62, and 65. And let me be very. I'm going to got about five, six, seven minutes. These, I think, are the are, are very significant because if you look at the at the text, there's italics there, on in there in which he condemns three things. And I'm going to skip much of it. There is italics that says, I confirm the direct and voluntary killing of an innocent human being as always gravely immoral. And he appeals here to the unwritten law which human beings hold in their heart that Dr. Pastana told you, sacred scripture, reaffirmed by sacred scripture, the tradition of the church, and as taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. In other words, what John Paul II is doing on the direct killing of any innocent human life, and also in his condemnation of abortion in, in, in paragraph 62, and his condemnation of euthanasia in 65, is he is, he is appealing to what we call the universal ordinary magisterium, which is, is infallible. In other words, Vatican II makes it quite clear that when the bishops in communion with the Bishop of Rome teach consistently on an issue as to be taught as to be taught without ear in the church, then that teaching is is part of the universal ordinary ordinary magisterium of the church and is to be held as infallible. It is not an exercise of of a sole exercise of papal prerogative or papal authority alone, but is that of the human church. Let me read Vatican II. According to Catholic theology, this is my words. A teaching of the ordinary and universal magisterium is infallible if it's taught by the bishops dispensed throughout the world as long as they teach it in a definitive and authoritative manner. This is Lumen Gentium, paragraph 25, the, the dogmatic constitution on the church. Before writing this letter, John Paul II, therefore, surveyed bishops in the world, asking them if they would agree that, that murder directly willed, that abortion and euthanasia were immoral, and they all agreed that they were. To make this connection clear, the Pope concluded each of the passages in the Evangelium Vitae, I mentioned the three to you, uh, with reference to the universal and ordinary magisterium. Uh, paragraph 58, he talks about the loss of the gravity of abortion. Paragraph 65, he talks about euthanasia, defines it for us, which I think is very helpful, because people get really confused about this. You know, I was talking to somebody last night in a nursing home, and somebody should know better and talking about ordinary, extraordinary, and was rather confused. I, th I think that's interesting. Uh, 65, um, we'll skip. 
Let me, let me find, turn to the last characteristic. What about the notion of law? Let me forget the five pages and get it real quick. Uh, you know, the, the principle is this, right? This is the issue of, of, um, of the relationship between, John Paul II is arguing here that based on natural law, everyone has a right to life, all right? Okay. All right. Um, and therefore, uh, it should be enshrined in civil law. In other words, civil law should reflect natural law or God's law. Got it? Okay, basically it. Now, on some issues, you don't need to do that. You know, people would argue, say, well, maybe marijuana should be, should be decriminalized. Yeah, so what? Who cares? I mean, it's not a big issue, right? But on some issues, it is crucial that civil law, civil law reflect moral or natural law which is grounded in God's law, which or what Thomas calls eternal law. You have to, it has to do that. In other words, when they're big issues, you cannot disregard them. Whether or not marijuana should be legalized is, is a prudential judgment. All right. But issues like this are, are, are crucial. And I, I think in this sense, uh, John Paul II is like Martin Luther King. Because Martin Luther King, in his letter from a Birmingham jail, made it very clear that any civil law, southern segregation laws that were not grounded in moral law or God's eternal law, as Thomas says, are not morally binding. Therefore, laws in our society are not morally binding. All right? So, you know, uh, in, in, a, so in other words, when it comes to those kind of issues, they're not morally binding. Now, it doesn't mean that everything that is immoral must be illegal, but some things must be. All right. Let me, let me quote something uh, about from Robert George, who, uh, Princeton University, who commented this in 95, and I'll be done. The grave injustice to the unborn of laws permitting and funding abortion make legitimate for, illegitimate for citizens or public officials to support such laws. They can never be justified as, say, drug legislation could, conceivably justified as a lesser evil. The prudential toleration of evil has, evil has no application in cases of radical injustice. So as the Pope says, and I quote the Pope, in the case of intrinsically unjust laws, such as a law permitting abortion or euthanasia, it is never listed to obey or to take part in a propaganda campaign in favor of such a law or to vote for it. Actually, I brought with you the guidelines of the bishops from the 2007 uh, uh, Faithful Citizen. The new one is, is not printed yet, but it's online. So if you go to the, the bishop's website, usccb.org, you'll find that the new document, it's, uh, I have a copy of that, but it's not printed yet. But I have the old one, if anyone's interested in that, as well as the interested in, the, uh, in the, um, this other piece. Let me, let me then close with two quotations. And I'm picking two guys who were involved together when justice issues and life issues and everything else was tied together. The late Father Richard John Newhouse, editor of First Things, not necessarily a flaming liberal, and Martin Luther King, Jr., not necessarily a member of, uh, let's say, any group. What's one of these? The Tea Party. All right. Okay. Uh, so let me take these two folks. <clears throat> this is Newhouse first. Here's what he says uh, to commemorate uh, um, Evangelium Vitae. We shall not weary, we shall not rest until the, every unborn child is protected in law and welcomed in life. We shall not weary, we shall not rest until all the elderly who have run life's course are protected against despair and abandonment, protected by the rule of law and the bounds of love. We shall not weary, we shall not rest until every young woman is given the help she needs to recognize the problem of pregnancy as the gift of life. We shall not weary, we shall not rest, as we stand guard at the entrance gates and the exit gates of life, and every step along the way of life, bearing witness in word and deed to the dignity of the human person, of every human person. And now King's very short comment, which tells us something about maybe our methodology in doing this. Whom you will change, you must first love, and they must know you love them. Thank you.